not going to sing with us. Don't forget the service tonight. The youth choir needs to be here at 5.30. For you visitors, these kids are going to be making a live tape tonight. A man's coming in to set up a studio. He'll be here at 3 o'clock. And he's going to make a live recording, just like we did about a year ago. And uh, it's going to be something else. They're going to be, their tapes go all over the country. They've been over a thousand of their last one gone out all over the eastern part of the United States. And they're going to be making a live recording. Uh, I took a gang of these kids. I take them on trips in the summer. And our youth activities consist of going to church. That's about it. And um, we took them to New York City. We took 130, us and another group too, in the middle of New York City. Can you believe it? I cannot. I can't believe I did that. Uh, we had a service in the middle of Times Square. We were out at guitars and had singing and preaching. Right in the middle, we went up on top of the Empire State Building. Uh, we took them to, to Florida last year in revival meeting. And they're going to be recording a live singing tape tonight in the service at 7 o'clock. So all of you are invited back. And then, of course, this week i got to travel to Dallas, Georgia, be in a camp meeting. So y'all pray for us about that. I'll uh, be here Wednesday night in the service. Our regular visitation services are like always. We'll make those announcements tonight. Acts chapter 17. Now, if you'll listen just a few minutes, we're going to be, I'm conscious you've been sitting here a while, and you need to, uh, I'll tell you like Liz Taylor told her seventh husband, I'll not keep you long. All right? Here in Acts chapter 17, look at verse 1. And when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and their, reason, their three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks, and a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren under the rulers of the city, crying, these that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received. And these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word of God with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. See two reactions to a church there in the book of Acts. Some liked it, some didn't. I want to speak to you for just a few minutes on the subject, there's a church in town. There's a church in town this morning. A few things I want to say about this church and the purpose of it. And the first thing I want to say is that there is a church in town that believes the Bible. We want all of you to know this morning there's a church in town that believes the Bible. We believe what this Bible says. We believe this Bible does not contain the Word of God. We believe it is the Word of God. We believe that holy men of God speak, spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. We believe that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. We believe that Charles Darwin was wrong when he said man evolved from a lower species. We believe that Jesus Christ was right in the book of Mark when he said from the beginning God made them male and female. We believe that God made man and put him in a beautiful garden. We believe that God made Adam and Eve not Adam and Steve. We believe that God put them in a garden and gave them liberty except for one tree of which they partook and the human race failed. We believe that God, through His promise, promised that a better day would come 
and that the Lord Jesus Christ would be born into this world. We believe that this book stands above all other books, head and shoulders. We believe that what the Bible says is true in all matters of faith and practice. We believe the best commentary on life is this book. We believe that the answer to all of mankind's questions are in this book. There's a church in town that believes the Bible. You can't fight this book. This book lives on no matter what generations say or do. There used to be a famous man named Ingersoll. And Ingersoll one day held up a copy of the Bible. And he said, in 15 years, I'll have that book in the morgue. 15 years went by. Ingersoll was in the morgue. And the Bible still lived on just fine. There's a great atheist named Hume that you've read about in history. He said, I think I see the twilight of Christianity. He said, Christianity is dying. But the Auxiliary Bible Society of Edinburgh held its first meeting in the room in which that old boy died. The Bible is God's book and lives on forever. Voltaire held up a copy of the Bible one time and Voltaire said this. He said, in 100 years, that'll be an outmoded and forgotten book only to be found in museums. 100 years went by. Voltaire's house was then used and owned by Geneva Bible Society to print copies of the Word of God. And we're in good company this morning when we say we believe the Bible. The Lord said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And I want to tell you what's wrong with our nation this morning, ladies and gentlemen. Our nation is in trouble because we have refused to go by what God said in this book. And we'll never get back on track until we get back to what God said. We must get back to it. Listen, this book will never fail. A lot of people say, well, it's the 90s, preacher. Yeah, I know that. And I'm going to tell you what, the year 3000 will be here before this book ever fails. Hey, when communism has fallen into the Alzheimer's uh, records of mankind, this book right here will still be prevailing. Hey, when the, Bat when the Vatican becomes a Baptist count meeting, this book right here will still be preached and still believed. Listen, this book will still be true when Larry Flint believes in modesty and chastity. This book will still be true when Madeline Mary O'Hara is teaching Sunday school to the adult, adult ladies class. This book will still be true when Dennis Rodman believes in humility. This book will... Say amen right there. I wonder about you if you don't say amen. Hey, this book will still be true when Magic Johnson teaches a seminar on abstinence. This book will still be true when O.J. Simpson agrees to take a lie detector test. This book will still be true when rock musicians admit they influence kids to drugs and sex and are responsible in large part for the downfall of a culture of young people in America today. This book will still be true when Michael Jackson is allowed to teach the boys' Sunday school class at New Man of Baptist Church. This book's going nowhere. This book is still true today. This book will still be true when Madonna sings like a prayer and like a virgin and even knows what they both are. This book will still be true when Ricky Lake has a God-fearing Christian give her testimony and tell about Jesus Christ on her television show. This, you ain't gonna like this, this book will still be true when Bill Clinton joins the army. Amen. This book will never pass away. God said heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. Somebody came to our church one time and they said, oh, you scream and yell while you preach. You mean you go to a church where the preacher don't yell? I wouldn't tell nobody. You need to get your dictionary and look up the definition of preach, man. Get your dictionary and look at it in Isaiah 58.1. That's the meaning of the word. That's the meaning of it. That's the definition. We're not, you know what our president said many years ago? Abraham Lincoln said, when I hear a man preach, I want him to preach like he's fighting a swarm of bees. Quote. That's what Abraham Lincoln said. Like he's fighting a swarm of bees. Do you think the president, our president now, likes to hear a man preach like he's fighting a swarm of bees? Now let's say there's a big one of these big, big nests underneath this pulpit. One of great big had those great long hornets in there, those killer kind. And all of a sudden, my knee hit that thing, and about a hundred of those things started swarming around me. Do you honestly think I'd stand here and say, "Ladies and gentlemen, 
it seems that my right kneecap has invaded the precious shrine of these little creatures. And perhaps, lest I be stung, I should perhaps move back a couple of... I mean, I'm a, that's the way I do, boy. And Abraham Lincoln said, that's the way a man ought to preach. Why our preachers today are too afraid of losing a salary are too afraid of offending the elite in the church. Listen, there's no hope for this nation, people, unless our preachers get back to preaching the Word of God as it is to people as they are. I want to tell you something. The the, the Bible says it's true. What the Bible says about the birth of Christ is true. He was born of a virgin. Some liberal professor in a seminary said, well, it's not really important whether you believe he was born. I want to say it is important. It's not only important, it is essential to believe that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. You cannot, listen, if Jesus Christ had an earthly father, he was a sinner just like me and you, and he had sinful blood running through his veins, and he couldn't save anybody. I'm telling you, he was born of a virgin. Somebody said, well, it's not, that is not scientifically impossible for a man to be born without the aid of a father. Listen to this. Adam and Eve got here without a mother or a daddy. They didn't even have a belly button. It's no big deal for God if he wants to put his son down here born of a virgin. He sure did. We believe that his death on the cross a cross is true. We believe that he died a substitutionary death for all mankind and paid the price for all of our sins before we was ever born. We believe that on the third day he rose again from the dead and he went back to heaven and he's sitting in heaven this morning looking down on this service and he's looking right in your heart and he knows everything that all of you are thinking and he knows ever where you've been and he knows everything you've done and he's willing to save you today and change your life if you'll come to him. He's willing to. We believe the Bible. It's the traveler's map. It's the pilgrim's staff. It's the pilot's compass. It's the soldier's sword. It's the Christian's chart. It tells of paradise restored, heaven open, and hell disclosed. Christ is its subject. Our need is its design. God's glory is its end. Let it be light to guide you, food to support you, and to comfort and cheer you. Read it to be wise. Believe it to be saved. Practice it to be holy. There's a church in town that believes the Bible is still the Word of God. Not, and we believe this Bible right here too. Not the NIV that says, that leaves out the plan of salvation in Acts 8.37. Not the New American Standard Version that changes the deity of Christ and the Trinity in 1 John 5.7. We believe the Bible that God has had His hand on over the years in our centuries and in our lives. There's a church in town that believes the Word of God. Secondly, there's a church in town that believes that kids are precious in the sight of God. You see, the biggest part of this this program this morning was made up of kids. And our heart beats for these kids. My heart breaks when I think about what some of them have to live in. You would not believe the stories. You would not believe. We were sitting right up there one night. Somebody began to talk about having right here in McDowell County about how kids, somebody had took these little kids and held cigarettes to their body and just held them down and burned them with cigarettes. And someone in the bathtub full of hot scalding water and was holding kids in the scalding water. Y'all of you remember the, a few years ago when the little baby was found down here on the Highway 70 and how everybody's heart was broken over it and my heart was touched over that story. But that is only the tip of the iceberg of what's being done to children today. It's unbelievable. million abortions every year in the United States of America. I don't care what you believe about it. It's murder. Doesn't matter what you think. Partial birth abortion that our nation has now put its approval on allows the baby to be partially born with arms and legs kicking while the instrument is being inserted in the back of the head and sucks its brains out while it's alive. That's what they won't tell you on CNN. That's what you'll never see portrayed on television because they practice censorship on things that they don't want you to know. There's a church in town that believes every one of those little boys and girls has a right to live just like me and you did and has a right to grow up and learn about God and country. Thank God there's a church in town that cares about them. Do you know, every 53 minutes in the United States, a child dies in poverty. Every 14 minutes in the United States, A child less than one year old dies. 
because of disease. Every, every three hours in the United States, a child is murdered. Every night, 100,000 kids in the United States go to bed with no place to sleep. Every year, 2.7 million children are, are reported to be abused. And that's just probably one-tenth of them. There's a church in town. Now me, I love kids. You know, there's something, sometimes I tell our churches, and everybody knows me knows this, there's something inside of me that I never did really grow up. I still feel the same as I did when I was 12 and 13. And ask them. I mean, they can tell you. And, and I, I'm telling you, I, I think more like a kid. And you're safe. You're much safer that way. I get a kick out of them. Every one of you ought to work with these kids. You ought to come out on a Saturday and get in your church. If you go to another church, get in. Fine. And work with kids. Get in and tell them about God. They will amaze you at their wisdom. You know what a lot of times we don't like about kids? They can stare a hole right through. You ever that? notice that? Man, they can see through you. They can tell if you're real or not. I like them. I like that. Because they're real. You can just, they just look right through you. One lady was going to have the preacher over for dinner. And she had the preacher and the evangelist coming over to eat with them. And she said uh, they got the food all ready and had a big spread there and had turkey and dressing and ham and, and mashed potatoes and green beans and corn and, and iced tea and, and hot rolls. And I better shut up. Y'all going to be getting up and leave here right now. But anyway, I mean, they had it all spread out. Little boy come to dinner. Preacher sat down. She said, now you mind your manners. The preacher's coming. Little boy said, Mama, where's the buzzard? She said, son, be quiet. We're not having buzzard. That's chicken. He said, but Mama, where's the buzzard? She said, son, be quiet. We're not having buzzard. He said, well, Mama, you said that old buzzard was coming over here. <laughs> See, that's what a lot of people don't like about kids. They can repeat every word that you shouldn't have said. One lady had all the church ladies over at her house one time. She had them all in there. She got them together, and the little girl came running in and said, Mama, which one's old Miss Hypocrite? <laughs> I like the way kids think. There's these two little kids talking in Sunday school. One of them looked at the other one. He said, Boy, I bet Noah sure did do a lot of fishing when he was on that boat. He's sitting there wanting to fish, and the other one looked at him, and he said, No, he didn't, stupid. He didn't have but two worms. I got it, man. That's got it. You know it. Bet you wouldn't have thought of that. One little kid, you know, a lot of times we try to fool them, but they're a lot smarter than we give them credit for. Much smarter. We got kids in our school in kindergarten already reading, writing, and even doing cursive in kindergarten, some of them. And did you know what? One little, teacher, one little boy comes to school. He was crying in Sunday school, and the teacher said, Honey, what's wrong? He said, My dog died. I've got my dogs killed out in the road. She said, Honey, don't you worry. Your little dog is up in heaven with God. He said, well, what does God want with a dead dog? <laughs> Pretty good, huh? This really happened. This honestly happened. I'll say this I'm hurt. This honestly happened to one of our teachers out in the school. You know how you come back from Christmas or, or vacation or something and you have a show and tell? Yeah, everybody remembers show and tell. You show it. And look, little kids, sometimes they get mixed up a little bit. They come home and said, Mom, it said, Doug, What'd you do today, son? She said, guess what, Mama? Tomorrow we're going to show our tails. She said, what? He said, that's right. We're going to show our tails tomorrow, Mama. One well, looked at Mr. Waddle, our principal up there. One little boy, he's here this morning. I guarantee he's up here somewhere. Where you at, Shane? Where's he at? Is he around? Oh, he's over there? There he is, way up there. He's backslid out of the choir and got up there in the balcony. One little boy came. At the first year, he was being real talking a lot and everything. They sent him to the principal. The principal got him out there and he said, Now Shane, he tried to be real stern and show a lot of authority. He said, I'm going to be watching you. You understand me? He looked up and said, Nice tie. <laughs> what a blessing. What a blessing. But you know what? I'm glad there's a church in town that believes kids are precious in his side. Thirdly, and I'll be through, there's a church in town that believe man's only hope is coming to Jesus Christ. All of our reform programs will never change the heart of man. Man must be changed from the inside out, not from the outside in. We have people here that's evident. You've heard some of these testimonies. We, I, wish, I wish all you people would come and hear the testimonies. Some of these kids, they look so clean. You would not believe the ones been on drugs, been out in the world. I mean, life ruined, ruined. And one thing changed them. 
That was their faith that Jesus Christ is who he says he is and that he can be real in your life. That changed them. I mean, I don't know how to change a person's life. I can't do it. But the Lord sure did and he changed their life. We have a man sitting here this morning. My wife knocked on their door recently. I asked him to do this so I wouldn't embarrass him. Him and his girlfriend have been living together for many years and, and living somewhere down toward Burke County. My wife began to talk to them, brought them to church on the bus and they got their life right with God and the other day got married and their life is straightened out and bringing their kids to church and the whole family's been changed. Stand up over here, Don. Stand up. There they are. They just got married the other day. Amen. Now listen. That, you hear me? That is not the power of religion. That is not the power of somebody just listening to a preacher talk. That is the power of Jesus Christ changing a person's life. God be the glory what God did in that man's life. There's a church in town that believes the New Age Enlightenment movement couldn't save a dead horse. It takes Jesus Christ and His blood. You'll never get to heaven because... Listen, while well, we've got all of you here, let me tell you something. You'll not go to heaven because you're a Baptist. You'll never go to heaven because you're a Presbyterian or a Methodist or a Pentecostal. You'll go to heaven through the blood of Jesus Christ or you won't go. You can be baptized and never... So every tadpole Mary knows your social security number and you'll die and die without God unless you've been born again. I'll give you this story and I'll be through. I know there's many of you here this morning. If I took a survey of this crowd here today, the biggest part of you would profess that you've been a Christian or been saved at one point in your life, I'm sure. The biggest part of you. And I heard a story one time about this boy. This boy got away from his dad and his dad was a real good man. He grew up in a nice home and out in the country and he rebelled against his daddy. And as he rebelled against his dad, he wound up getting in a fight and actually striking his dad, hit him in the face. And he ran away and went out to a far city out west somewhere and hit bars and began to drink and live his life in sin. And after he's out there a little while, he got saved. He met the Lord Jesus Christ and his life was changed. And he decided to go back home and talk to his dad to see if his dad would let him come back and live. And he got on a train and he's riding a train home and he's sitting there just bawling and nervous and there's a preacher beside him. He looked over and said, Young man, can I help you? You act troubled. And the young man said, Preacher, and he told him that story. He said, I've wasted my life. I've all been all messed up on alcohol but now Jesus has saved me and I'm going back home and I'm going to ask my daddy to forgive me. And the preacher said, that sounds wonderful, son. But why are you crying? Why are you upset? And the man, the man said, you see, I don't know if daddy's going to forgive me or not. He said, I don't blame him. He said, I told mom and dad if they'd let me come back home. There's an old apple tree outside the old home place where we live. And he said, I told daddy if he'd let me come back home, that he'd tie a white rag in that old apple tree limb. And I'd look out the window of this train, and if I saw that apple tree with that flag hanging out of it, then I'd get off and I'd know I'd welcome home. But he said, Preacher, I don't know if Daddy let me come home or not. And he said, I'm afraid I'm going to look out there and there ain't going to be no, there's going to be no rag on that tree. And the preacher said, Well, son, I'll look for you. And he said, It's just around the next curve. And that train ran around that curve. And that boy said, I can't even look. I don't know if mom and daddy let me come back or not. The train went around that curve and come down through there. And about that time, that preacher punched that guy and said, Hey, man, I want you to look out that window right there. And he said that boy looked out that window like that, ladies and gentlemen. And he said there wasn't one, wasn't two. There was white rags hanging all over that apple tree. And he said right underneath it was an old white-haired mom and dad standing there waving, saying, I'll take my boy back. And I felt like the Lord wanted me to tell you that story this morning because there's a lot of you in here this morning. You need to come back to God. Listen, we're running out of time, people. You're not getting any younger. Life is short. Life's too short to waste. If you're not ready to meet the Lord today, just remember this. There's a church in town. And there's a lot of churches. We got a lot of good churches in McDowell County. I'm not insinuating this on. There's a lot of 200, matter of fact. You can go to just about any one of them and get saved and get your life changed. 
God will work a work in your life. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. I can't give an invitation this morning. There's, too, there's no room to come to the altar. But I would like to pray for you this morning. And if you'll bear with me just a couple of minutes, we're going to pray with you and let you go. No one talking, no one moving. Give me, just concentrate on the Lord right now. God's speaking to your heart this morning. I'm just going to ask you. It's the largest crowd ever assembled for a church service. You don't want to go out of here this morning without letting Jesus touch your life. If God's speaking to you this morning, you say, Brother Danny, I know that I'm a sinner. And right now, the best way I know how, I'd like to ask Jesus Christ to come into my heart, save my soul. I'm depending on Him to be my Savior. Why don't you just tell Him that right now? We can't have an invitation. There's not even room to get up here. But you can right there in your seat say, Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I'm sorry for my sin. And I believe you died for my sin. And right now, the best way I know how, I accept you and you only as my Savior and my only hope for a home in heaven. I believe you died for me and now I want to live for you. Now heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Please be patient with me just a minute and I'm going to let you go. If you prayed that prayer this morning and you meant it from your heart, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, would you slip up your hand and let us pray for you this morning? Just slip up your hand all over the building, okay? There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. I think 21, 22, 23. You can put them down. There's 23 souls right there. Just ask the Lord to come in. I mean, you say, well, it's not that simple, preacher. It sure is. It sure is. If you prayed that prayer and meant it, Jesus washed your sins away. There are those here this morning say, Brother Danny, I know I've been saved, but I'm not living like I should live. No one's looking, just me and you and the Lord. I'm not living like I should live. Please pray for me. Slip up your hand. All over. I know I'm saved. All right, God bless you. Hands all over the building, all over the balcony. God bless you. Why don't you get back in there this morning? Why don't you get back in there this morning? We're going to give you a chance just to sit there and pray and let God work in your heart. Dear Jesus, thank you for touching these 23 lives here this morning. Not only these, but all them on the bus kids up on the hill in the other building. God, do what ought to be done in our lives. Help these that need to be get their heart right with thee, not to be stubborn, not to be too proud, to make up their mind from this day forward, they're going to live for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.